Hi. Hi, everyone. Welcome back from your coffee break. Um, we're going to work on getting more people into the room. I don't know if they can hear me out there. I'm just yelling at all of you now. Um, I hope that you feel refreshed. I hope you had fun taking the group photo. I hope you feel re-energized with some caffeine in your system. And we're going to get right into the next talk. So George Pepu from VAL is going to come up and talk to us about imitate versus innovate, right? So right now, what we're trying to do is we're trying to make a uh, cell egg chicken that is indistinguishable from factory farmed chicken or ideally pasture grazed chicken. We're trying to make beef that is indistinguishable from the quote, real thing, end quote. But George is going to make the case for innovation, thinking outside the box, and the case for cell cultured elephant. So I'm going to pass it off to George. All right, good morning. Um, my name's George. I have traveled here from Sydney, Australia to explain to you why cell-cultured elephant is actually a really good idea. So let's get into it. Let's start with the very beginning. Why are we all in this room? And a really big reason for that is for one way or another, we look at this as something that we don't want to take with us to the future. Whether you care about the rights of animals, whether you're concerned about the climate that we live in, or whether you just care about the productivity of manufacturing, you look at this and you go, this sucks and we really don't want to do more of it. Cell Ag is obviously cool and interesting too if you're here, because we can take the production of animal tissue into advanced uh, facilities near where people eat it, fueled with renewable power, which is great. So let's just start by stepping right back to the very first principles of cultured meat. Thinking about it in the simplest possible terms, Cultured meat is taking in primitive ingredients like sugars, salts, amino acids, and growth factors, and using cells inside of this magical black box to turn those into biomass that we can consume. Run the whole thing on renewable energy, and you get a really much more sustainable way of producing food. There's two really massively outsized levers in this process that drive the scalability, the economics, and the quality of food that we can produce. That's the cells that we use to make the food and where we source those cells from. And that's the product that we choose to come out the other side with. Let's go into each of those individually to look at what are the best things that we can be making from both the food that we can enjoy and the cost and the scale we can produce it at. So if we were starting with a blank sheet of paper, if we were going right back to the beginning with no preconceptions of what we wanted to make, what would be the best cells for cultured meat? They would, of course, grow really quickly. They'd grow to really high densities. They'd grow in dirt cheap media, basically Powerade. They would last forever. And they would be really tasty, safe, and resistant to shear so you can scale them up. The best possible cells for cultured meat would do all of these things fabulously. So let's just like zoom in on one of them. Let's just, let's just look at the speed at which cells grow. If you look across a bunch of early primary cells isolated from different species, these are all muscle stem cells at low passage, and the rate at which they double, the main species we eat, things like chicken and beef, typically around 24 to 30 hours straight out of, uh, sort of straight from initial tissue di digestion. Some other species, things like migratory birds, like uh, the warbler, can be as low as eight or nine hours. So when it comes to just looking at one of these parameters, the species that we've domesticated are a really long way away from the front. And this is pretty much true in every one of these characteristics, whether it's shear resistance, whether it's density, whether it's the uh, cost of media. Beef, chicken, and pork put a really huge amount of additional constraints on making and scaling up cultured meat. And that brings us to cell cultured elephant. So quick question, who here thinks that cell cultured elephant would win on all of these dimensions? Put your hand up. I have some really exciting news about elephant cells. I am betting my entire career, my reputation, my investors money and the jobs of all 54 people on the VOW team that elephant cells are going to be the best at all of those things. Every single one of them. Who here wants to place that bet with me? Wow, you two are nuts. <laughs> 
And it sounds kind of crazy, right? There's 10,000 animals on the planet. There's 10,000 species of mammals and birds on this planet today. What are the odds that elephants are going to be the best possible cells to grow in cell culture? It's basically zero. Of course, they're not going to be the best at everything. But that is the bet that almost every cultured meat company and researcher is placing by focusing their effort on some species that we've traditionally consumed. The odds of beef, chicken, or pork being anywhere near close to the front of the best possible things that we can be producing to scale cultured meat as quickly and as economically as possible is nearly zero. So let's look at the other side of this equation. Let's think about the meat that comes out the other side. So they might not be economical, but they're definitely the most delicious, right? Our ancestors went searching around the whole planet to find the tastiest possible animals to domesticate, right? Kind of. So around 10,000 years ago, our distant ancestors were chilling in their village, and a red guinea fowl and a wild boar kind of wandered in, and they were like, cool, these animals are pretty laid back, don't get in our way, rep like, reproduce easily. They're great. Let's just, keep, let's just let them hang around. And we've kind of held on to this tradition because we've always had this legacy, and these animals are easy to industrialize and scale up. We've spent hundreds of years developing and refining their genetics to grow well in intensive ag animal agriculture environments. What do you think the tastiest animal on the planet would be, though? If we could go and search through, I wonder what the best would be. Luckily for us, someone's already done that. It's not me, yet. Give me a few more years. Charles Darwin. <laughs> Charles Darwin, as he sailed around the world on the HMS Beagle, had a hobby. And that hobby was catching, killing, and eating a huge variety of animals to see how they tasted. He meticulously documented this. He was a scientist, after all. He described puma as tasting a lot like veal. He described tortoise as being exceptionally delicious, although its urine was a little bit bitter. <laughs> he had a university club called the Glutton Society, which did a similar thing. They disbanded after they ate a brown owl so disgusting they decided to stop doing the society. Who can guess what Charles Darwin thought was the tastiest animal on this earth? <laughs> I had elephant and kangaroo, both are wonderful ideas, but totally wrong. It would be great if it was elephant, though. That would have been very thematic. No, the tastiest animal on this planet, according to famed naturalist Charles Darwin, is, of course, the agouti. <laughs> A 20-pound South American rodent found in the jungle. He ate everything he could get his hands on, and he said the agouti was by far the tastiest meat he had ever consumed. So. Coming back to what we're doing in cultured meat, by sticking with just the major domesticated animals, we're not setting ourselves up to produce the cheapest possible uh, cell mass in scale. We're not setting ourselves up to make the tastiest possible meat that we could. So why are we choosing these animals? Of course, it's to meet customers where they are today. The big assumption that we're making as an early cultured meat industry and a group of cultured meat researchers is we can have impact by replacing one food with the same thing made in a different way. How will we know this works? We're years away from being at a commercial scale and at a cost to answer this in the real world. But luckily for us, we can look at what's happening in the plant-based world and get a sense of how this is gonna pan out. So plant-based is doing pretty well. They're at taste parity. According to blind taste tests, impossible is, in, in, in the case of beef, about 40 to 60% of people prefer it. In the case of their pork, it's more like 80 to 90. And in the case of their chicken nuggets, I think it's over 90% in blind taste tests. So taking away all of the how it's made, all of what it is, plant-based meat is at taste parity. And understandably, the category is growing. And that growth means a huge number of animals are being saved. Hundreds of thousands or millions of animals are being saved through the growth of this category, which is great news, right? Mission accomplished, job done. <laughs> Everyone go home, conference over. I can get away with that because I'm Australian, I hope. <laughs> um, Ellen told me I could, so any complaints, please direct to Ellen. 
Except what's happening now, as we've seen this play out in the market, animal meat has grown more than 10 times faster than plant-based. In the US since 2018, the growth of animal meat in dollars spent is more than 10 times the growth in plant-based meat dollars spent. When it comes to volume, it's more than 40 times. And even when it comes to per capita, each of you, at least the ones from America, are eating more meat than you have before. Even though you're eating more plant-based meat on average, you're eating substantially more animal meat in total. So no matter how you look at this, the increasing consumption of plant-based uh, plant meat is not displacing even the same amount of animal meat. It is an and and not an or. Following this same strategy, with a more complex, expensive manufacturing technology in the form of cultured meat, is not going to yield a different outcome. So, let's go, back to the, let's go right back to the beginning here. If our goal is to change consumer behavior by focusing on traditionally domesticated animals, we're not starting with the cheapest and the easiest to scale cells, we're not making the most delicious products. And the whole concept of meeting consumers where they are and they just switch over and the problem solved is not playing out. But there is an alternative. Oh, sorry. Uh, it's not playing out, and so if this is what we want to prevent, we need to find an alternative. And that alternative is breakfast cereal. Bear with me here. <laughs> it's like the elephant thing all over again. So I want each of you to think, just think through this scenario. I transport you 100 years into the past. The main breakfast cereals on the shelf are cornflakes, shredded wheat. Every single breakfast cereal is a single grain that people know transformed into a new format. And I want you to walk up to someone 100 years in the past and explain to them what this is. Who knows what this is? Exactly. What is a Cheerio? Exactly. <laughs> I was trying to imagine this. I was sort of playing this out this morning. I was like, how would I do this? I'd be like, it's round, and it's crispy, and it has a bunch of grains, but I don't know which ones, and it's kind of sweet. Everyone knows what it is. It's really, really good. And that's kind of it. There was a period around 80 years ago where Cheerios were introduced for the first time, and they were this insane novelty. For us now, they are so utterly mundane, it's boring. We have the ability to do the exact same thing with cultured meat and cellular agriculture. We can just invent entirely new types of meat that are going to become as abundant, well-recognized, and well-understood as a Cheerio is 80 years in the future. Who here in this room wants to invent a new type of meat that every single person on the planet will know and understand in the year 2100? Yeah, right? How much better is that than making a chicken nugget? Sorry to everyone making chicken nuggets. <laughs> That's basically what we do at Val. Uh, we use cultured meat to invent food that could not exist from animal agriculture. We do so by building a library of cells from a really wide range of species and cell types, and we treat them as ingredients that can be combined in ways that animals can't to make food that is tastier, more nutritious, or more functional than things that animals make. The whole reason we do this is because we believe consumers are selfish. We believe the decision that we make in a restaurant or in a supermarket or when we're ordering on Uber Eats is to pick something that makes us feel good. And so if we can use more sustainable manufacturing technologies to make food that people want more than animals, that is how we change consumer behavior en masse. Over the last three and a half years, We've built out a cell library of around uh, 21 species across mammals, avians, reptiles, and marine species, specifically with the goal of understanding how they taste, how they cook, look, smell, and the economics of their growth, so that we can treat these as ingredients to make products that animals can't. And this has a few really handy advantages. We don't have to restrict ourselves to the finicky biology of chicken, beef, or pork. We can just keep scanning until we find things that are easy and cost-effective to grow. We can create a product that animals can't 
that is differentiated, solves a problem, and we can charge a premium for that as a result of it. Later this afternoon, we're going to hear about the techno-economic challenges of cultured meat. The huge assumption that's missed there is those, that case is only true if you don't change the other side of the equation of what people are buying. Cheerios cost a hell of a lot more than the commodity grains that go into them. In fact, General Mills that makes Cheerios have better margins than Netflix or Tesla. So just by creating differentiated and branded products, the economic challenges become substantially easier. And the best bit, and our entire secret as a company, is if you make something that never existed before, no one has anything to compare it to, either in price or in sensory experience. So if I hand you a product that we've made, I tell you what you're about to taste, and it tastes like what I've said, you're going to be like, oh, that's great. It's like when you go to a wine tasting, and they're like, oh, it's leathery, and it's got a bouquet of raspberries, and you're like, oh, yes, it definitely does. That's lovely. <laughs> Whatever they tell you it tastes like, if you taste that, you're like, great, that's fantastic. And so by not replicating animals, it's actually a substantially easier, te uh, easier technical challenge. And we end up with products that are so different that we're able to market them in an entirely new way. This is the very first product that we're launching. We're launching this as soon as the end of this year in Singapore. And it's just called Morsel. It's not an animal. I don't really care about animals. I care about making the best possible food. You can see it cooking on a yakitori grill over some charcoal there. When you eat morsel, you get this really big umami hit up front. It's really intense roasted meat flavors. And it kind of melts in your mouth a little bit like a beef brisket or like a buttery prawn. And as you chew it, you get these really nice aromatic seafood notes that come out. It's just really, really tasty food, but there is no point of comparison for it. It is entirely new and a really wonderful experience. But I know what you're thinking. That's great and all, but why, like, how do we know people are actually going to eat this? How do we know this is actually going to create change? There's never been a new meat introduced in my lifetime. Except there has. There's been a bunch of new meats introduced over the last 50 years. Sashimi, or raw fish, was basically illegal in the US up until the 1990s. Rules changed, it got introduced to very, very high-end dining, you know, $50 a plate sushi places in LA and New York, and then the mid-range restaurants that looked to the high-end restaurants for inspiration started to introduce it and serve it. And then the low-end restaurants that looked to the medium-range restaurants, they started to do the same. So when I was a kid, I used to watch American TV, and the sort of punchline would be, if someone said anything about sushi, ugh, raw fish, a couple of years ago when I walked into a Walgreens in San Francisco, they have a sushi section serving sashimi. So in around 25 years, sashimi went from illegal to so ubiquitous you could buy it in a Walgreens. The same is true of things like ribs in Australia and pork belly in the UK. Over the last few decades, parts of animals or ways of serving animals have went from, uh, gone from not being present in a market to being so ubiquitous they can be found in every supermarket. The same can and will be true for products like Morsel. They will become ubiquitous and abundant, and we'll just get used to them because they're going to follow the pattern of every new meat and every new cut of meat that's been introduced over the last 50 years. So I'm sharing all of this for one really simple reason. We as an industry, whether it's research or as companies, succeed or fail as a group. We are judged as a group. And I'm asking everyone here, just have a think about copying this strategy. It makes some of the technical challenges of making cultured meat products substantially easier. But more importantly, it gives you unbridled creativity. We have a technological platform here where we can choose to make literally anything we want. You can invent any type of food you can imagine. And that is just an unbelievably exciting proposition. So I want to end with saying, don't obsess over animals. You're an incredibly creative and ambitious group of people. Go and invent something that makes chicken look like crap. Thanks. I'm keeping it. I'm keeping the clicker. So here's the thing. We keep losing track of the clicker. It's fun. I'm keeping the clicker. Oh, the first question, so spicy. <laughs> I can get straight to that one if you want. Go, go for it. Go I'm for Australian. It. <laughs> I said that at the beginning. 
Who said that? Who's put your hand up? <laughs> I think they're. Are they? Oh, yeah. Okay. Fair. <laughs> I have a British accent because I don't know. My parents are from England, but no, I was raised in Australia and we have really good food there. I have no idea what any British food is, so you're safe. <laughs> Amazing. Um, so, so I have to ask the question. I mean, so first of all, again, can we get another big round of applause for Vouse Foods, by the way, for uh, auctioning off a visit to eat, what was it, crocodile and quail combo? Yep. That sounds pretty wild. Um, what are you, I don't know, what are you most excited to, to, to eat? I mean, I've seen a few <laughs> people throw out a few animal options. You talked about a few up there. Which one is yeah. sort of the one that gets you the most excited? Is it the thing you've already done or is it something, <laughs> something coming down the pipeline? Uh, it's really, I, I used to think a lot about like, oh, I want to eat tortoise, but then we started making things. And we're like, actually, most cells don't taste like the thing they're from. And so I start to think about what flavors do I want? And it's like, I want really, I really like very rich, uh, like really, really rich um, sort of fatty collagen-y meats. And so I just want something which is like really intensely rich and fatty and collagen-y and metallic mm -hmm. and serve that with, you know, it's winter in Sydney, so I'm thinking about like rich wintry dishes, like red wine sauce, that sort of stuff. Mm. Okay. Uh, he's already thinking about wine <laughs> pairings, this guy. <laughs> we're, <laughs> we're ready. Um, okay, I, I like, okay, these two questions kind of go together. So there was a, what are your thoughts on making this library of different animal cells open source? And maybe <laughs> how, do you get, how have you gotten access to tissue samples from yep. all of these species? So those kind of go hand in hand. Yep. How did you get it? How does everyone else get it? Um, so let's start with the tissue samples. Um, most of the tissue samples we're working with at the moment are from uh, game meats or kind of uh, meats that are hunted routinely. So they're already available in the food system. There's some slightly tricky Australian regulation about samples from live animals, and so we have to work with what is already available to, uh, through either hunting or um, sort of game agriculture. So we work mostly with abattoirs to get our samples initially. That will change hopefully soon. We've been working really, really closely with uh, some of the uh, zoos and conservation associations around Australia uh, to find a pathway to both get access to samples, but importantly provide access to the cell lines from those to the research and especially the conservation research communities. So kind of answering the other question, we are very comfortable to and very eager to make some cell lines available. And so if there is something, if especially if research is in the room, uh, if there's something that you really want to be working on or really want to uh, test out, um, definitely come and have a chat with either myself or Ellen or Neil from our team. I'm very open to sharing cell lines. Um, I think we will deposit them in cell banks over the next couple of years, uh, but we're kind of busy trying to make things work at the moment. <laughs> fair, fair. You do have a business to build. <laughs> um, this one's interesting, and this one is not just for, I think, Val Foods. This is a question that I've heard uh, about a lot of cellular agriculture. So if you talk to proponents of, for instance, regenerative agriculture, right, what are we trying to do? We're trying to eliminate factory farming. And if we do that, if we just let the animals graze on open grass, they're going to taste better because of what they eat. So there's this conception that animals taste like what they eat. And so this question is, well, do you actually get that rich sort of, sort of deep gamey flavor if you're growing these in a bioreactor and feeding them cell media, don't they just taste like what they eat? So the cell media does have a really big influence on it, um, but there are other components of cells which do have a big impact on the flavor, texture, and mouthfeel. So things like collagen, having more highly collagenated cells, give you that sort of soft, silky mouthfeel. Increased phospholipid content is responsible for a lot of the aroma you have when it's cooking. Uh, and there are uh, the, the exact amino acid mix in combination with some of the carbohydrates that are present within those cells has a really big impact in the end flavor. So yes, media has a big impact because it has a lot of free amino acids, but there are other things which also have a really big impact that work either in tangent or in addition to those amino acids in the media. Mm -hmm. So it's not just the media, but it is a very influential component. Mm. That's interesting. Um, I kind of like, I kind of, I kind of want to call out this next question, <laughs> which sort of, we're sort of lingering on this place of where we're talking about the experience, right? Mm -hmm. The experience of eating food <laughs> together. Um, and this person says people eat meat largely because of cost, convenience, and culture, yes. right? And all of those things, the culture part goes into experience, but cost and convenience are, are very big factors. So um, how does this approach address those considerations? How do you think about it in that context? So uh, I spoke a lot about cost up front. If the goal is to create the cheapest cultured cell mass, mm -hmm. it's not going to be beef, chicken, or pork. 
I can t say that from a lot of bitter experience, you're trying to grow beef, chicken, and pork cells. They're really, really tough species to grow in any kind of scalable way. There are other species that are substantially easier. So if the goal is the lowest cost cultured meat, that isn't gonna be something we've already eaten. So getting to low cost and high convenience as a result of that low cost, that's going to come from this strategy. When it comes to culture, culture does change in food, and our food culture has changed a lot over the last 50 years, even more so over the last 100 years. The only way we're going to influence that is by starting at the absolute top end of the market, which is where all new food trends come from. Um, if you look back to uh, you know, what Noma was doing in Copenhagen 10, 15 years ago with fermentation, how many fermented products are on supermarket shelves now? And that was really driven from that high end of fine dining, gradually moving down market into your supermarkets. So culture only changes when you offer something new into where, where food culture originates. I like that. I like that. That's very interesting. I think, oh, the, <laughs> this is sort of a, well, I know, okay, people want to know what's in, <laughs> people also apparently want to know if Darwin ate humans, but we're not going to go there. What's in, what's in morsel? <laughs> Um, did you did you tell us what's in morsel? Is this the no. crocodile quail thing? So the formulation of morsel does change. Um, morsel is a food experience. The same way the formulation of Cheerios has changed over time, the formulation oh. of morsel has changed as well. Crocodile and quail is one of the formulations. It has since changed and it will continue to change and evolve even when it's on market. It is a food experience that we want to deliver at a consistent quality at a reduced cost over time. And one of the ways that we do that is by switching out cell lines. Okay, thank you. That's a helpful response. Okay, everyone. Thanks to George. This was amazing. Another round of applause. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, there were some more spicy questions up there that I'm kind of sad we didn't get to. So I hope that you're going to corner George after this and, and, go, and go ask him those. Um, up next, we're going to be talking about a lot of the questions actually that you were asking just now were about a little bit about inclusion, right? That question about culture touches on this. So inclusive cellular agriculture engagement. Um, for us to deliver on this promise that we talk about of building a more just food system, we have to sort of look past the technology and think about how to responsibly usher it into the world. And so that means not wreaking havoc on the lives of people who depend on animals uh, culturally and for food and otherwise. Um, they use salmon as an example here. I'm not going to give away their whole panel, but I think you're really going to a 